Cool. <laughs> you know, for me, one of the biggest blessings and one of the biggest curses that I know of in fellowship is you. <laughs> really. You're the biggest blessing that I know of. And you're the biggest curse I ever saw. As well as me, but... The reason I say this is because, you see, I love when people come and tell me what Jesus is doing in them and what's happening in their life and how God rescued them and delivered them from some circumstance and just how they related to him in some unique and special way that I never knew or I might know or I might have participated in something like it. but. You see, when a person shares with me their personal experience of what God has done, then I go, wow, Lord, man, that was neat. You never did that with me. No. <laughs> I do. Sometimes I do. You know, I go, hey, God, look, man, how come they get to hear your voice audibly? How come they get to, you know, like, know you intimately? How come they get to walk with you daily? And you don't do that with me. Oh, gee, what's wrong with me? You know, and then other people, I listen to them, and, you know, I, I see how God has carefully construed their circumstances that he may not be quite the same, you know, the way the one person described him, but still I see Jesus in them, and somehow you just know that there's a glow about them, that they, though they lie in a hospital bed or they're suffering, you... You can sense the presence in them. They have a tenderness or a gentleness. They have a quiet confidence, a peace, a faith, a joy. You know, and I just want to be around them. They're like, wow, that's awesome. That's the Lord. And then there are other people that, you know, again, sometimes it's the same person. They tell me about their religion, you know, and how... You know, their hermeneutic is homiletic and how their homiletic is hermeneutic and how their tendentialism has become, you know, the realization of some type of exhortation that they have that they have to statement their faith they're all the way into some kind of dissertation so that they can have a whole theological presentation so that we can all sound like we're important. <laughs> I eat people for, the, for lunch. <laughs> people that want to go, you know, nutsoid, you know, and become trapezoid and oscillate, you know, and delineate and designate and coordinate, you know, their religion, you know, I'm not interested, you know, it's so simple, you know, to be logical, it's so simple to be about the things of God without being with God that I don't want to hear it, you know, the theology is too simple to argue about, it's too easy to find out, you know, if you're on the internet like you should be since you have a video and you're watching me. You can Google it. Who cares how deep you get or how much you think you have this wealth of knowledge now that you've got the Bible school or the school of theology or the PhD and the THD and you've juggled all the wisdom of man and you suddenly come up with, what? Now maybe that's good for you. Hey, cool. But for me, I wanna hear about Jesus, you know? I wanna hear about God. I don't wanna hear about how some new presentation of the same old reworking of the realization of what God is and who God is and how God operates has suddenly become knowledgeable, you know, to you in a neat, neat, you know, mental way. Because I can argue with the best of them. I've argued with rabbis in Jerusalem. I've argued with anybody, you know, and it doesn't profit me anything. But when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about how God is alive, when we talk about how God works and how God moves and how Jesus is literally speaking and how he promised we could know even more and that we haven't attained to all that God has in store for us, that I want to hear about. That I want to see. I want to know that you've been with Jesus today. The one thing that always impressed me about somebody I grew up with, you know, in my early days as a Christian, Chuck Smith, was that somehow... Now, I didn't always, you know, get everything I was teaching because I'd be busy, you know, like reading my Bible on the floor, you know, and I'd be flipping pages, you know, while he's teaching. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I was one of those. <laughs> but my point is, you always felt like he had just walked out of the presence of God and that he had just talked it over with the Lord and he was sharing with you what, what God had said. And somehow you felt like he, he just got done with the Lord, you know, and he's sharing it with you. And that's what I want. 
I want you to know the Lord in that way. And I want to hear what you have to say. Because it's easy to be religious. It's a quite, a quite a different thing to just walk out of the presence of God and to communicate that to the people. Because you see, when Moses did, his face shone and they had to put a veil over him. When the priests came out from the Holy of Holies, it was obvious they'd been in the presence of God. Today, when you go about your day, is it obvious that you took the time today to be with the Lord? That's what I want to see. Because you could be the biggest blessing for me if you just spend the time to be with the Lord. But if you got a lot of religious stuff to tell me, a lot of practical realities and some new theological way of doing something, no offense, if it works for you, praise the Lord, go do it. But for me, just give me Jesus. Because each one of us have a different way of explaining, relating, and God working in our lives in a unique and distinctive way that he reveals himself in all of us so that the fullness of our communion together reveals how Jesus operates and how the Father is revealed in the bride in the completeness of her unity and love. Today in streams, oh, we're going to do that too? <laughs> As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrow was beautiful, but her beauty was the beauty of the moonlight, shining through the leafy branches of the trees in the wood, and making little pools of silver here and there on the soft green moss below. When sorrow sang, her notes were like the low, sweet call of the nightingale, and her eyes was the unexpected gaze of one who had ceased to look for coming gladness. She could weep in tender sympathy with those who weep. But to rejoice with those who rejoice was unknown to her. Joy was beautiful too, but his was the radiant beauty of the summer morning. His eyes still held the glad laughter of childhood, and his hair had the glint of sunshine's kiss. When joy sang, his voice soared upward as the larks, and his step was the step of a conqueror's who has never known defeat. He could rejoice with all who rejoice, but to weep with those who weep was unknown to him. But we can never be united, said Sorrow wistfully. No, never, and Joy's eyes shadowed as he spoke. My path lies through the sunlit meadows. The sweetest roses bloom for my gathering, and the blackbirds and thrushes await my coming to pour forth their most joyous songs. My path, said Sorrow, turned slowly away, leads through the darkening woods with moonflowers only shall my hands be filled. Yet the sweetest of all earth's songs, the love song of the night, shall be mine. Farewell, Joy. Farewell. Even as she spoke, they became conscious of a form standing beside them, dimly seen, but of a kingly presence, and a great and holy awe stole over them as they sank on their knees before him. I see him as the King of Joy, whispered Sorrow, for on his head are many crowns, and the nail prints in his hands and feet are the scars of a great victory. Before him, all my sorrow is melting away into deathless love and gladness, and I give myself to him forever. Nay, sorrow, said Joy softly, but I see him as the king of sorrow, and the crown on his head is the crown of thorns, and the nail prints in his hand and feet are the scars of a great agony. I too give myself to him forever, for sorrow with him must be sweeter than any joy that I have known. That we are one in him, they cried in gladness, for none but he could unite joy and sorrow. Hand in hand they passed out into the world to follow him, through storm and sunshine, in bleakness of winter cold and warmth of summer gladness, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. The abundance of life and the fullness of the measure of reality that God has created for this humanity to wear is simply the filling of his Holy Spirit to cause his creation to be made born again into his new creation that can experience the fullness of all emotion and know that none of our emotions that God has given us was meant to be denied but to experience to the completeness of the realization that God created them in us for us and to us and that we can have Jesus in the midst of them for surely we have all of it for a purpose and a design that God wants us to experience to enjoy to be aware of to shed tears in, but to have laughter too. For in the combination of all these in proper perspective, if Jesus is standing in the midst of them, he is fulfilling all of them, and you can experience them to a measure you've never known before. 
Think of that. Each emotion you can experience in a measure you've never known before that goes beyond comprehension. And as you walk with him, and as you talk with him, you can not only experience that, you can have it in right balance, that even in sorrow, there would be joy.